Our guest tonight has spent better than a half century traveling the world of sports, reporting on and analyzing big events, visiting with athletes who not only were great competitors and well-known to people, but also introducing us to competitions we might not have been familiar with, and meeting athletes we didn't know even existed and suddenly realized that they had a place in the sports world as well. He started out and served 21 years on the sports department of the Boston Globe, at a time when the Globe, with its murderer's role of sports writers, had the reputation of being the outstanding sports department of any American daily at the time by admission. And then, after 21 years at the Globe, he moved on for 12 years at Sports Illustrated, working on more long-form journalism, and at that period of time, Sports Illustrated was well known for the quality of its writing, which was probably the best writing you would see in any magazine on any subject on your newsstand. And then for a third act, he's moved on to authoring a wide variety of books. Many of them are on display behind us. He's here to talk about his newest book, which is Tall Men's Short Shorts. Copies are available for purchase at the back of the room, and our guest has been kind enough to offer to autograph any books you purchase. Oh, sure. This book recalls the 1969 NBA Finals, and to this day, this is known to basketball fans as one of the great final series ever. You know, in that series, the Lakers featured Wilt Chamberlain, the gargantuan center, whose records still got the NBA record. Shot shooting guard Jerry West and Elgin Baylor's high wire act predated players like Julius Irving and Kobe Bryant who came behind him. And the Celtics countered with the greatest winner in American team sports history, Bill Russell, and John Havlicek, whose motor never stopped running, an athlete of freakish skills, and Sam Jones, whose bank shots off the board from Every conceivable ink, ink was a big factor as the Celtics had a dramatic offense that moved the ball quickly and forced the defense into difficult challenges. These two teams played for seven games, and as I said a moment ago, it was a very memorable series. When the Celtics qualified for the NBA Finals, the Globe decided that they would send their young sports writer Lee Monville, to cover the series. The players I mentioned, Chamberlain, West, Baylor, Russell, Sam Jones, were all 30 years or older, and John Havlicek was 29, and Lee was 24. <laughs> he didn't turn 25 until the following month, until July. And this was a huge assignment as people throughout New England waited anxiously for the Globe to hit their front stoop in the morning to read his analysis of the game and the quotes that he got from players, players who were older than he was. He's in his third act, concentrated on writing books uh, about people like Muhammad Ali, like Dale Earnhardt, Ted Williams, Babe Ruth, and now uh, an event that was so impactful to basketball fans everywhere, including this one, and impactful in his career. It was a big assignment for a young man. We're delighted to welcome back to his adopted hometown at one time, Winthrop, and to the Winthrop Public Library. Our guest tonight is the author of Tall Men, Short Shorts. Please welcome Lee Monville. the whole book away. Yes. <laughs> I've got nothing to say. Uh, it's just nice to be back in Winter. I've been here for 20, 25 years in Woodside Park and uh, Sergeant Street. And uh, I came here and I, I moved here because I would fly in on planes and I would look out the window as we were landing and I would see beaches and, and the ocean right next to the city. And I said, well, that looks like a nice place to live, you know? And I, I eventually came out here and, and looked around, and uh, I went to a, uh, 
a, a, a wedding reception at the Cottage Park Yacht Club, and I wound up living in a, a condo next to the Cottage Park Yacht Club. So it, it all kind of worked out, and it was, it was great living here, and, you know, the ocean. I live in Medfield now, which has no ocean, and I, I never see the sunsets. The, the sunsets here were spectacular. Um, so I, I, I miss Winthrop. Um, and it, it, it's, it's great to be here and see everybody. Frank DeFelice here, um, he, he was, he was a, a, an assistant football coach at Swampscott High School. The first, first assignment I had at the Boston Globe was to go talk to Stan Bondalevich, who was the coach at Swampscott High School, and, and do a story about Swampscott football. That my boss said that would be an easy way to start. So the first story I worked on, I saw Frank, and uh, that makes us both kind of old, <laughs> but uh, pretty good. Uh, let, me, let me get started here. You, you know, they always say that, that you're going to do a reading, you know, but nobody ever reads because it's kind of boring when you read. Um, but but, but I, I, I do think I, I'm going to read a little bit here. I, I did the audio book for this. I've written 10 books. And I'd never done the audio book for any book, and, and they said, do it. And they recorded it in four days in Brighton. I would get sit in the closet and just keep reading for eight hours uh, every day for four hour, for four days. And uh, I, I think they sent the finished product to Guantanamo Bay to get those guys to talk, you know? Um, but it was, it was kind of interesting to do that, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so uh, let, let me do it. Let me do the reading here, just just the beginning here, because it kind of tells you what the book's about and what I'm about, I guess. I don't know. Uh, this is just the introduction, and it's real short, so I won't read for very long. Uh, the introduction. I wrote much of this book during the 2020 NBA playoffs. It was an odd process. At night, I watched the Los Angeles Lakers step-by-step -step journey to get another title on television in what was called a bubble. The month was October, the time for baseball and football, not basketball. All games were played in an antiseptic gymnasium next to an amusement park in Orlando, Florida. By day, I spent my time in another bubble, 1969, where it was spring and the Lakers were trying to win their very first title in Los Angeles. All games were not played in an antiseptic gymnasium next to an amusement park in Orlando, Florida. There were fans in my bubble. There was actual noise, loud noise much of the time. An organist, John Kiley in Boston, Gaylord Carter in Los Angeles, played music during the timeouts. Hot dogs were sold, beer. Yes, there were tall men, Bill Russell, Will Chamberlain, Jerry West, John Havlicek, Elgin Baylor. Yes, there were short shorts, canvas sneakers, no instant replays, no commercial breaks. Big stories, little stories, injuries, details, interviews, phone calls from phone booths, cigarettes, basketball, basketball, basketball. I spent time in buildings that no longer exist. I worked with people who no longer are alive. I traveled across the country, back and forth on airplanes. I ate in restaurants, I drank in bars, I talked to friends, sometimes late into the night. I rode in cabs, I talked to strangers, some of them famous, face to face. I bought three newspapers every day, first thing in the morning, read them with a tactical and discerning eye, looked for news I had not heard, worried, analyzed. I went to the games. Yes, I did. I pushed through crowds, I shoved, I stayed up late, I woke up early, West Coast time. I stood in lines, everybody close together, I hustled. The rush of it all, the colors, the emotions, the deadlines, the locker rooms, the quotes, the typing, the worry, 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 my heart sometimes seemed as if, it was going to, as if it was going to explode. I was young. I was younger than I thought I was. I was 100% alive. The games at night on television from the 2020 bubble were very good, interesting, congratulations to everyone involved. But they seemed to be played in, la in a laboratory or on a spaceship circling the moon. I looked at the big NBA logo on the Disney World hardwood floor the most familiar figure in the production, appreciated the talents on display, acknowledged the results, congratulations to LA, and the next day, very early, 
return to the other bubble in my notes, in my memory, in my mind. Hello, Wilt. Hello, Bill. Hello, Jerry. Nobody had to wear a mask. So it, it's, it's, it's kind of my 700-year-old self looking back at my 24-year-old self kind of going through all this stuff. And, and you know, when you're 24, you, you, you have a, 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 a mixture of confidence and a baseline of fear, I think, you know, that you, you try to show the confidence and you have the baseline of fear and you just kind of stumble along. Um, as, as Pete said, I, I, I was selected to, to, to go do this job and cover the, the Celtics in the playoffs in a weird situation. I, I, I thought they asked me because I, I was great, you know, I was the next Hemingway, I was going to be the, the star, the great, the great reporter. Uh, but the real reason was the guy who covered the Celtics, there was, there were, for the Afternoon Globe, there was the Morning Globe and the Afternoon Globe. The guy who covered the, the, the Celtics for the Afternoon Globe was a guy named Herb Ralby. And Herb had covered the Celtics for a bunch of years, um, and, and he had a second job. He was also the publicity man for the Boston Bruins. And it, it was kind of a conflict of interest, I guess you would say, you know, to be publicity <laughs> man for the Bruins and cover the Celtics for the Globe. Um, but he'd been able to cover all this stuff because the Bruins were terrible. They were never in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They hadn't been in the playoff, playoffs for seven years. But then this, this young kid had come along, this kid named Bobby Orr, <laughs> and all of a sudden the Bruins were in the playoffs as well as the Celtics. So Herb Ralby couldn't cover the playoffs because he had to handle all the press arrangements and the tickets and stuff for the Bruins. And so that left the door open for me. And, and, and I wound up covering uh, the, the, the two previous series against the, the, the Philadelphia uh, 76ers and, 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 the New, and the New York Knicks. And uh, the Celtics weren't supposed to do very well. They had won, you know, the, they'd won the title the previous year. They had, won, they had won 10 out of the last 11 years. They had won the title, which you would think would make them big favorites. But they were getting old, you know, pieces had fallen off through the years. Russell was getting old and looked tired. Sam Jones, the, the great jump shooter, um, was getting old and looked tired. And the Celtics finished fourth in the regular season. And they really shouldn't have been in the playoffs, but it, you know, it's a money deal, and, and so the fourth place team was in the playoffs. And the Lakers were an overwhelming favorite because they had added Wilt Chamberlain to Jerry West and Elgin Baylor. It was, it was a move, if you remember way back when, Players just couldn't move on their own. They, they, they had to be traded and uh, teams owned their rights and, and deals had to be made. Um, but Wilt kind of forced his way out to the West Coast. It, it was like uh, a forerunner to LeBron James, you know. He kind of made it known that he wanted to get out of Philadelphia and he wanted to go to Los Angeles. And uh, in a way he went. And, and so he set up kind of the first super team and the Lakers were favored to win the championship from the previous July when Wilt signed his contract with the, with the Lakers. And so that was kind of the setting for the whole thing. And, and I, I, was, I was kind of just thrown into it. Uh, everybody else seemed to be 35. The guy who, who, who covered for the Morning Globe was Bob Sales. He was 35. George Sullivan was a guy who covered who covered for the, um, uh, for, for, for the, uh, the, the Herald, the Boston Herald, which was a separate paper. He was 35. And Eddie Gilhooley was the guy for the Record American, and he was 35. And I, I was 24, and I was just married, and I didn't know anything. And, but, I, but I had this confidence that, that I could write it better than these guys. That, they, that these, at 35, they were old hacks, you know? And I, <laughs> I, I was this... this bright new wave that was coming onto the scene. And uh, it, it was interesting. Russell was an interesting guy for me, Bill Russell. Um, like I say, he was 10 years older and rich and famous. And, and, and I, 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 he, he was prominent in, in, in all social causes and stuff. And he was very aloof. And he, he really didn't have time for a little, a little five foot nine Right, a guy who didn't know much about much, 
And, and so I'd say on four out of five days, he would kind of, kind of brush me off. And then on the fifth day, he would go, um, okay, and we, we would be just alone. There, there wasn't like a big surge in media. I mean, I would be like the only one in practice sometimes, and I would go in and I, I would just go, Oh, Bill, you got a minute? You know, and the guy, the guy, he was, the, he was, you know, he was doing everything. He was the coach of the team. He was the star of the team. Um, he had no assistance. He was a player coach. He had no assistance. You look at the, the Celtics today, and Brad Stevens last year, he had about 15 assistants. They all wore those little zip-up pullovers, you know, they looked like the Mormon Tabernacle Friars. And Russell, you know, was playing. There was no coach on the bench when he was playing, which was 48 minutes a game. And he would come back winded and then kind of have to straighten things out. And the only other guy was the trainer. <coughs> and now they have like about seven trainers, you know, to take care of each part of your body. And this guy, Joe Delore, he, he, I don't know, he, he had no medical degree. He was, he was just taped ankles and uh, <laughs> and, and, it was, and he made all the he made all the plane reservations and the hotel reservations and all of that. It, it was a small operation. The Celtics were a small operation. They had four employees outside of the team and and, and Joe Delore. They had Red Arback, who was the, the, the president and general manager. They had Red Arback's secretary, Mary Whalen. They had Howie McHugh, who was um, a publicity man. And, uh, and, and, and they had uh, Jeff Cohen, who, who was 23 years old, and, and he asked Red if he could be the, he could be called the assistant general manager, and, and Red said, sure. And, and he had to get coffee and donuts every day. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. If you wanted to get a season ticket, you went to the Celtics office on, on like the, the mezzanine level, and you went in and Red took you to your seats. He showed you to your seats to show you where you should sit and everything. It, it was an unbelievable business model. I mean, I mean, now they have this huge building on the Massachusetts Turnpike, the Celtics. And, 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 uh, and then they had the, just this little office with Red and his feet. And Red would sit in his office and he had, he had, he had a great letter opener co collection and he had great photos on the wall. and. and he, he would just sit there, and he, he used to like to watch Hawaii Five O every afternoon <laughs> and watch Hawaii television. And, and he'd say, "You want to sit and watch this?" So it, it, it was an interesting thing, and, and Red was great, and, and the other guys on the team were great. But Russell was just hard because he he had no time for me, you know. I mean, he, he had he had things going on, so the history. I I mean, I, I'll go all over the place, but. The history of Russell and, and Wilt Chamberlain was, was kind of famous, you know, I mean, Wilt Chamberlain, the, the truest thing I say in this book is, is that in all the years since Wilt Chamberlain played, there's never been a player to come along where everybody said, look at this guy, he's going to be the next Wilt Chamberlain. There's been nobody since Wilt Chamberlain who looked like Wilt Chamberlain, maybe Shaquille O'Neal a little bit, but not really. Will Chamberlain was a physical marvel, and his one problem was that he had like a ten cent head. And, and, and Russell, who, 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 who was who, who, who didn't match up physically with him, had a great head. But Russell was cerebral, and Chamberlain was physical. I mean, that was the difference between those two guys. And I mean, Chamberlain didn't like to practice, and when he did practice, he fooled around. And uh, he had trouble with every coach, and, and, and he, he would eat hot dogs before the game. He would, he would sit in the, the, the locker room and eat hot dogs. Russell would throw up before games. He'd be so nervous. I mean, that's kind of the difference. I mean, Russell had the focus, and Chamberlain never had the focus. He, he seemed to operate like, like there was one of those cartoon light bulbs over his head, and, and like the light bulb would go on, and he'd say, Tonight I'm going to score. And he'd go out and he'd score 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 points. He scored 100 points. And, and he could just score. And another night he would say, I'm going to rebound. He still owes the, the NBA record for 55 rebounds in one game. Um, and then one year he said, I'm going to get assists. And he led the league in assists. He just 
Right? He, he, could, he could do anything except really apply himself, I think. That was the, the big thing. And so the Lakers, though they were the big favorites, had had problems during this season meshing Chamberlain with their whole operation. Butch von Bredikoff, who'd been the coach at, at, at Princeton for Bill Bradley, who was the coach now with the Lakers, he, he didn't like Chamberlain pretty much from about the second week he was there. He, he called him the load because, because Chamberlain was kind of slow coming up the court and they had to play a slower game. And there was always a, a, an argument whether Chamberlain should be at the high post at the top at the top by the foul line where he could pass the ball off to, to, to Baylor and to West and kind of create plays or if he should be in the low post where he had always operated and, and he could just get rebounds and dunks and, and, and do stuff. And Wilt thought he should be in the low post. Uh, Bob Bredikoff thought, thought he should be in the high post and it, it went back and forth and, and Bob Bredikoff called him the load and Wilt didn't have much respect for Brad Brady Cup, but they still finished first in the West, and, and they were in the finals. And, and the Celtics, um, you know, kind of kind of sucked it all up and, and beat Philly pretty well, and then played the Knicks. And the Knicks were like like the year before became they, the year before they became the great Knicks team with with. Uh, to Busher and, and Walt Frazier and all of those guys and won the championship. Um, this year they, they, they were kind of had put all the pieces together and, and they'd been good for the first time, but the Celtics kind of had the experience and, and beat them in six games. So we get to the, the finals and, and, and Los Angeles for the first time has the first two games, has the odd game, it's best of seven, and they have the, the odd game. Um, I, I should go on about, about Chamberlain and Russell. I, I weave these anecdotes about my life in and out of the book. And, and I was 16 years old when I saw when I saw Chamberlain and Russell play for the first time. It was it was uh, Chamberlain's rookie year. There, there used to be a thing in the New England basketball tournament, high school basketball tournament at the Garden, and uh, and there'd be two teams from Connecticut, two teams from Massachusetts. Uh, and one team each from, from Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Rhode Island, and Maine. And it, it, was, it was a grand occasion. When I was a junior in high school, the team from my school qualified to come up here to, to, to the, and, and you know, teams, it was in New Haven, Connecticut, and teams from New Haven had done very well up here, and it was legendary. They always told you about going up to Boston and, and getting drunk and all this stuff when you were 16 years old. And, and so we all wanted to go and we somehow convinced our, our parents that we, we, should, we should be allowed to, to come up to Boston unchaperoned or anything, you know. And I think my, my key argument was I have my own money. And, and so we came because I had my own money. And we took the train up and we stayed seven kids in the, the old Statler Hilton, uh, now the Park Plaza. And, when we got into there, it was a Catholic school, Notre Dame, Notre Dame High School in West Haven. And when we got in there, uh, we were in the lobby, and the kid said, there's a thing called burlesque. <laughs> and, and, and it's, it, it, it's, it's called the casino, but it was really the old Howard had been changed the name to the casino. So we, we went down immediately and went to this burlesque show. And, and, and I, I recorded it as, as as Tempest Storm was the, the, the thing. But, and that's what's in the book, Tempest Storm. But I have to collect it for the paperback because a couple of the other guys said, no, it was Sally the Shape, 48 by the Temp. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you can Google her up and you can see a fine picture and you can see that it is Sally the Shape, but I recognize her from that big smile. <laughs> um, so we have to change. So we go to, the, we, we go to that. And then we go to a basketball game, and, and our team wins. And then we're coming back, and we say, what else can we do? And we go through Scully Square, it was still there, and, and we find a sailor, and he buys us two quarts of whiskey. <laughs> and, and we're all 16 years old, and we bring the quarts of whiskey back to the hotel room, and nobody knows how to really drink or anything. And, and so I, I said, 
Well, you drink whiskey. I, I, I've seen these cowboy movies. They, they pour a full glass and then they chug it down real fast, you know? Well, they chug down a, a shot glass of whiskey. But all we have are the water glasses. <laughs> so they all, they, there was enough whiskey in the, the two quarts to, to chug down two water glasses of whiskey a piece, you know? And so that made us very sick and do bad things and everything. And then the next, the next day, uh, Notre Dame was eliminated from the tournament. And the day after that, in the afternoon, there was a matinee. It was the Celtics and, and, and the Sixers. And, and so I saw him. I was way up at the top, you know, in the third deck. And my head was pounding like this. And, and they, they were about that tall. Maybe Chamberlain and, and Russell were that tall. And, uh, and, and I just felt very sick. So I had experience with Chamberlain and Russell. I, I knew all about this match. I mean, this was the only time I'd seen it. Uh, but uh, Russell had always, had always prevailed against Chamberlain, except for one year. And uh, he, he had embarrassed Chamberlain. And he had also embarrassed the Lakers. The Lakers had played five times against the Celtics in the finals and had never beaten the Celtics. So there was a lot of history that, that Chamberlain had to had to come around and, and, and shed this negative thing. And the Lakers had to shed this negative thing. And they were set up to do it because it, it was seven games. It was two games, two games, one game, one game, one game. And, and the first two games for the first time were in Los Angeles. And he went out there, and the Lakers, sure enough, won the first two games. The first game, Jerry West scored 56 points. He was wonderful. It was, might have been as great a game as he ever played it. And it was a fabulous game. The next second game, not so great, not so great a game, but the, the Lakers prevailed again. Close, but they prevailed again. So they came back to Boston and the Celtics won the third game. You know, they they, they went back to their, their favorite thing, the Celtics' favorite thing was running. They always, we can run, we can run past all these guys. And, and they, they ran past the Lakers. And, and so now it's two to one. And, and the, the next game, the fourth game, is a pivotal game. And it comes down to, uh, it, it's kind of a sloppy game and everything. But it comes down to a, a big play at the end where the Celtics had the ball. And then a whole bunch of things happened. But the Celtics had the ball. And they had like seven seconds, seven seconds to get a shot off. And they go into their, and they're behind by one point. And they, they go into their, their, their uh, on, the, on the bench, they start talking. And Havlick, John Havlicek and Larry Siegfried had played together at Ohio State. And they, they had a, a play. They had a play that they had worked a couple times at Ohio State. They won a national championship. And they, they convinced Russell that they should use this play now. And the play, the, later, that play is, is used and called the picket fence in, in the movie Hoosiers, mm -hmm. where, they, where, where, where they set a triple peck, and, and Jimmy, whatever his, Jimmy, whatever his name is, the guy in, in, in Hoosiers comes around and makes the shot. So they set that same play up for Sam Jones. They set a three-man pick, Havlicek threw the pass to Sam Jones. Sam Jones came around. And, and he slipped, and, and he, he, he threw the shot up off his wrong foot. And he thought, well, I'll just get the ball up there, and Bill Russell can get the rebound, and maybe we can win the game that way. But Bill Russell had taken himself out because he thought that maybe, maybe the, 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 uh, the Lakers would foul him. So he wasn't even in the game. Sam Jones just got the, shoot the ball up. It hit the rim, bounced high in the air, bang, came through the basket, the horn sounded, see you later. The Celtics won the, the, that game. And if they hadn't won that game, they would have been dead meat. It would have been, would have been all over. But they won that game, and it was like a magic game to win. And uh, from there, we went, on to, we went on to Los Angeles, and, and the Lakers won in Los Angeles. The Celtics won back here in, in Boston. And it all came down to the seventh game. And you have to buy the book to find it. <laughs> can't Google it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's people, there's a lot of people that, I'm surprised, I guess it's just aged so long ago that there's a lot of people that have said to me, 
don't tell me who wins the seventh game. <laughs> <laughs> you know? and, and it's like, it's like, it's lore, you know, that the seventh game is, is like a famous game. Um, but I'll tell you what happened. Uh, it gets down to this, and all of the, this time, we've been traveling back and forth, and I, I had never, I had never been to, to, to California, to Los Angeles. Uh, I'd never seen the Pacific Ocean. I'd never seen a palm tree. You know, I'd never been to Florida. So, like flying, flying over to California the first time was a great thing. I had never been on a plane flight where they showed an in-flight movie, you know, and the movie was Bullet with, with Steve McQueen. And that was great, the car chases and stuff, and, and I'm drinking the free <laughs> and smoking. I was smoking the whole way. I was smoking those lucky strikes, pushing them out, and the whole thing. It was a wonderful time. And, uh, and, and so, uh, flying back and forth and back and forth. Well, on every flight, it was Bullet. We were flying in the Netherlands in one movie. So we'd seen Bullet, you know, and it came to the final game, and Russell switched from United Airlines to American Airlines because he didn't want to see that to the So we're out there, we're out there for the seventh game, and, and, and the, the big thing that happened in, in the seventh game was uh, before the game, it, um, Jack Kent Cook, the millionaire owner of, 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 of the Lakers, and, and no, you, you should know that, that like Boston Garden was one thing. It was old, antiquated, funky. You know, Amy Semple, McPherson, and you know all these different people. Winston Churchill had spoken at, at, at Boston Garden, and the fabulous forum where the, the Lakers played was one year old. You know, and it was clean and air conditioned and you know sweet and and. and so there, it was like it was like a dichotomy between the two, and everybody had like golf shirts and, 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 and polo shirts and stuff when they went to the games. And here, they, you know, everybody was the animals. <laughs> and and uh, so we're, we're out there, and before the game, uh, they pass a press release around, and Jack Ken Cook, the owner, said, "When the game ends and the Lakers win." We have all these balloons up on the ceiling at, 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 the, at, at the forum, and we're going to drop all the balloons. He had the University of Southern California marching band there. And they were going to come out playing Happy Days Are Here Again. He had like 10 cases of champagne all set for the Lakers and all of this stuff, you know. And, and the Celtics got one of these releases and read it. And, and you know, who knows if it inspired them. I think, I think we put too much stock in that kind of stuff, but but it certainly inspired anybody else who was watching, you know? And the game unfolds, and, and the Celtics, for a while, they're just killing the Lakers. The Lakers come up very flat, and the Celtics have a 17-point lead at one point, and it's the fourth quarter, and the, the lead is starting to shrink a bit, and it's shrinking, and it's down to nine points, and all of a sudden, Wilt Chamberlain hurts his knee. And he, he puts his hand up and he says, my knee, uh, you know. And so he, he asks out because he's hurt his knee. And they bring in Mel Pounce, who's a seven foot guy, like Will Chamberlain, but, but he's an outside shooter. But, but Von Bredikoff, the coach, had always liked the team when Mel Counts played because they played faster, because Mel Counts could run better than Will could run. And so Mel Counts comes in and and they crawl back, and they're, they're within like, like three points and two points, and Wilt on the bench says, I'm okay, I'm ready to go back <laughs> in. And Von Bredikoff says, that's all right, sit back down, we're okay. And, and it was like either the, the gutsiest or the most foolhardy coaching decision in the history of mankind. Um, because it, if they win, He's like a genius because he had no counts ready to go and, and they won. But if they lose, I mean, they, they brought Will Chamberlain in for the express purpose of winning the title. And, and he kept him on the bench at the thing. And, and long story short, they, they, there was another play late in the game, the same thing as the Sam Jones play. Um, John Havlicek was, was dribbling and Keith Erickson, who was one of the, one of the Lakers, Slapped the ball away from from Havlicek, and 
And if the Lakers got it, they, they could have gone down and scored and taken the lead. But the ball bounced right to Don Nelson, who was right at the foul line. And it, the 24-second clock was down, and so he had to throw the ball. And he threw the ball up real fast. And once again, it hit the rim, and it went high in the air. And in the retelling sense, it's gone higher every time you tell it. It's up to like, you know, space shuttle stuff now. And it comes down and it goes through the hoop and the Celtics win the game. And, uh, and the balloons have never come down and, and, and the, the band never comes out. And, uh, and, and it's all kind of very sad for the Lakers. Jerry West was named the most valuable player uh, by Sport Magazine, which was a big deal at the time. And he's the only player on the losing team ever to be named most valuable player. Uh, probably, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, probably because the final game was in Los Angeles and there were more voters from Los Angeles, I don't know. Um, but it was quite a thing. And, and I, I wound up going back to my room and, and you know, firing up about a billion lucky strikes and typing my little story out. And, but, oh, I know. The, the locker room after the game, it, there's like chaos, right? You know, the Celtics win the title, the Lakers lose, the Lakers are desolate, the Celtics are, are happy, and, and we're all waiting outside to go in, and, and Warren Beatty is walking by, and a son of celebrities, and oh yeah, there's Warren <laughs> Beatty, and I don't know what to do, and, and, and Will McDonough, who worked for the morning paper, says he's going to write the story about the balloons and stuff. So what do I write? I don't know. I want to write about the Lakers, because to me, that's the, the most crushing defeat I ever saw. But I'm writing for the Boston paper, so I can't do that. So I'm figuring out an angle and all of this. And, and McDonough comes up to me, and he says, uh, could you do me a favor? He said, I, I, I want you to uh, wait till everybody leaves Russell. And when you can get them alone, just say, Bill, are you going to retire? And, and and, and, and I say, well, why don't you do that? Why don't you ask him? He says, Russell hates me. <laughs> he said, you have to ask him. So I said, okay, so now this is in my mind. And, and there's another thing. Russell, I, I forgot this way. I, I recruited Russell to, to write for the Boston Globe. The, the Herald and, and, and the Record American in the past had different players. They would kind of write a thing, you know, uh, with, a, with a strange byline. You know, I, the way I saw it, you know, by John Havlicek, the way I saw it by Red Orbach. And we had nobody. And I said to my boss, we should get somebody too. And he said, well, everybody's taken. Who, who can we get? And I said, well, Muscle might do it. And, and he said, do you think he would? It was, like, it was like this strange idea that I brought. And I said, well, I can ask him. And so I went, and, and I went, Bill, and, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I said, Bill, you know, in the Globe. And, and he said, well, what will it pay? And they told me they would give him something like 200 bucks a column. Wow. And, and this was at the start of the, the playoffs. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And there was no handshake. There was nothing. I mean, there were no lawyers. There were nothing. He said, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And so I went back and I said, okay, he'll do it. You know, I, maybe there was a contract somewhere, but, but he did it after every game. But my job after the game was to, to remind him as, as late as I could, like, uh, Bill, I forgot to call the Globe, you know, and he did. He, he called every time except once. So at the, end, at the end of this fabulous seventh game, I have to ask him if, uh, if, if he's going to retire. And I had to tell him, don't forget about the club. You know, you, you've won as your coach or a player. You've won the title. You, and so, and, and so I'm waiting and waiting. And, and I get my stories. And I'm looking. And he's getting dressed. And he's getting dressed. And Jim Brown, the football player and the actor, is sitting there with him. And they're talking. And, and Russell is like all, pretty much all dressed. And it's just the two of them. And, and at that time, you know, if, if you talked about two socially relevant black men in America, it, you, you would talk about Jim Brown and, and Bill Russell. And if you would talk about 
the whitest guy in America, the shortest guy in America, <laughs> bring her in front of us, he'd probably talk about me. So I, I go over and I, and I go, uh, Bill, <laughs> is there a chance you're going to retire now? And Jim Brown says, he had like a deep voice, and he said, retire? The man just won the world championship. Retire? And so I went, oh. <laughs> and so, and then I started walking away and I turned and I said, oh, Bill, don't forget to call the globe. You know? And so Bill called the globe and, and, so we, and we all came back and, uh, and, and they had a parade. They had never had a parade for the Celtics. It was the first parade they ever had. They hadn't had a parade for anybody. And they had, they had some convertibles and stuff and Russell didn't show up and, and a couple of the players didn't show up. But they had these cars, and, and, and so I was watching them, taking my little notes. It was like three days later, and they had a reception down in City Hall. And, and, and the guy said, uh, well, there's space in there. Why don't you go in the car, you know? And I said, okay. And I sat in the back of the car with the Celtics victory parade, you know? <laughs> and, and, and there were a few people. There was like, like a little few shreds of paper coming down from some office somewhere. And I said, well, this is how Lindbergh felt, you know? <laughs> and they got back and they had the thing. And, and that was the first sports parade in Boston. And, and the next year, the Bruins won the Stanley Cup, and it was a madhouse. You know, they had a parade, and, and, and all the parades have been crazy ever since. Um, so that's the whole story. I, I, I don't know. How much time do we have? Here? So as much time as you have. No, no. I, I can read a story it's funny. Just, just at the end. It, it's, it's a coda at the end of this book. And, and it's kind of interesting in that uh, it, it, it's, it's years later. And, uh, and uh, let me see. I can't find it. Oh yeah, here we are. Okay. Yeah, that's not too long. So this is the this is the code. Time has passed. The year is 1992. The Summer Olympics are being held in Barcelona, Spain. The dream team is here, a collection of stars from the NBA wearing the uniform of the United States. These are international celebrities, players known by their first names alone. Michael and Magic, Larry, Charles, a representation of how big the sport has grown. The bright young man, I call myself the bright young man throughout the thing. I, I start the book, I'm, I'm flying on the plane, and, it, and I, it's, it's the 700 year old me looking at my 24 year old self, and I call myself the bright young man, and I make comments about him all the way. And I didn't know if I could, I, I didn't know if I could carry that out through the whole book. I said, what's a synonym for bright young man? There's no synonym, you know? <laughs> and then I said, I could do an acronym. So I, 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 I called myself TBYM. And, and, and that kind of gave me a little fluidity to, to talk about myself in the whole thing. So anyway, the bright young man is 49 years old, not so young anymore, and certainly not as bright as he once thought he was. He works for Sports Illustrated full-time now. He's divorced after 21 years of marriage, two kids. McDonough, 57, divorced, remarried, still works at the Globe, but has become much more famous as a pro football expert and commentator on NBC television broadcasts. NBC has brought him to the Olympics as a reporter. He, he works often here with O.J. Simpson, another NBC voice. On a night in the middle of the games, McDonough and the not-so-bright, not-so-young man run into each other on the deck of a cruise ship anchored in the Barcelona Harbor. Sports Illustrated has rented the entire ship for three weeks. One of the magazine's traditional marketing ploys is to fly the fattest of bat cat advertisers to both the Summer and Winter Olympics, put them up in a four-star, five-star hotel, treat them to three or four days of sports action, wine them, dine them, send them home, and bring in a new batch of fattest fat cats. <laughs> the limited number of four stars and five stars in Barcelona, alas, have been booked by the other enterprises, by other enterprises, and SI scrambled with creative thinking 
to rent the entire cruise ship. Part of the fat cat package is a party thrown on the ship. SI brings Olympic stars of the past on the <coughs> scene to mingle with the guests and the latest Olympic heroes, snatched from the victory podiums and the headlines. John Havlicek is here from the past, along with Mike Ruzioni, Winthrop's own. Wilma, you always have to say that. <laughs> Wilma Rudolph, Edwin Moses, assorted greats. Three of these parties are being held, at, are be, are held during the Olympics, one for each group of fat cats. And TBYM is invited to all of them as part of the SI staff. Will McDonough is invited because he is part of the NBC coverage. O.J. Simpson is invited, too. The night is warm. The full moon hangs over the Mediterranean. Nick and the nice guys, an oldies band out of Rochester, New York, imported only for these parties, bangs out the Alan Freed songbook. TBYM and McDonough enjoy a couple of cocktails. Fat cats in their country club casual golf shirts and Palm Beach blazers are everywhere, accompanied by their well-tanned fat cat wives or sleek fat cat companions. Waiters slide through the crowd with expensive thing, finger food. Gra glasses are refilled automatically. This is pretty good, huh? TBYM says in a quiet burst of movement emotion. Yes, it is, McDonough says. He becomes philosophical. You know, you get into this sports writing business, and you know you're never going to make a lot of money, he says. The business doesn't reward people that way. You won't get rich. Money will always be a problem. You do, however, get experiences. You go places, see things. You have great seats. You get to be around people with money sometimes, too. Not often, but sometimes. You come to a thing like this, and for a night, a couple of nights, you get to live the way they live. You eat what they eat, drink what they drink, see what they see, you talk with them. You get to live in their world. There's a pause. You're right, the former bright young man says. I guess we're a couple of lucky guys. No pause. We, McDonough says, I'm talking about you. You're the lucky guy. I have this kind of money. There's <laughs> a lot of money. I am one of these people. I live like this every day. I'm talking about you. <laughs> the former bright young man smiles. Wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> Wondering uh, when you were writing, did you uh, did you interview, or were you able, or did you consider interviewing uh, some of the players who played then now, like Bill Russell? Yeah, and, uh, Bill Russell. It, Bill, Russell's, Bill, Russell's, Bill Russell's not in great shape, um, and, and I, I sent a couple things to his, his fourth or fifth wife. I don't know, and, uh, and, and never got anything back from him. And, and I, I, I don't think he's in very good shape at all. Um, but I did talk to Don Nelson. I talked to, I talked to Mal Graham, who's a, a local guy. He was a judge, and he played on that team. And uh, Tom Sanders, I talked to him. Um, so I, 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 talked, I, I talked to a few guys. But they, it, they, there's been so much written through the years about these games that, that there's a lot of stuff you can look up and find. And, 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 and when you talk to these guys, they kind of kind of say what they've said already, you know? I mean, we all have our, our stories when we reach a certain age and we, we, we kind of spin our greatest hits and, and that's it. Mm. So I did talk to some guys and, and, and uh, you know, I talked to a guy, Father John Creed, who, who was around at that time. He was, he was kind of the, the team, whatever. And it, he's not Father John Creed anymore. And he's a married guy and he married a, he married a nun and, and, and uh, is very anti Father John Creed. <laughs> uh, so he was fun to talk to. Uh, he, he, talk, he, talk, he talked to, like, like Russell did retire. He did retire uh, about three months later. He retired in Sports Illustrated. And they gave him $10,000 and he, 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 he retired for the $10,000. And so the next year they got Hank Finkel um, to replace him. And, and, and Ben Orbach said, well, we got Hank Finkel, we don't have, we don't have Bill Russell. 
But I finally, I, I, I get a good Jewish boy as, as my center. So, <laughs> so Father John picks up, picks up Finko and they, they go to Camp Millbrook where they had summer camp for the, the Celtics uh, down in, in Mansfield. Mosh and, Field. And, and, and they play games <laughs> and, uh, and, and they play the first game and, and they have referees and everything. And Hank Finkel gets fired and he goes up to the foul line and he does the sign of the cross. <laughs> <laughs> and it just falls over. Like <laughs> so much for the, the very Jewish set. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, sir. Um, you talked about the East Coast fans and the West Coast fans. Uh, what was the fans like in 1969 compared to today? The Celtics struggled during the regular season. I mean, they would have games with like 4,000 people would be there. Um, the, the, the playoffs, people would come. But Russell had, had, a, had a tough arrangement, a tough relationship with the, the city of Boston and the fans. And uh, it, he came out in a Saturday evening post article. And some bad things had happened to him here, um, racial things. And he came out and said, uh, you know, I, I I don't play for the city of Boston. He said I play for the Celtics. I play for my teammates, and I play for myself. But I don't. And and people around here didn't like that. Um, Red Arback always had had a thing where he said when things when things would happen with with, with African American players, Red would say, "Well, you you came up against the bad apple." You know that that was his theory, the bad apple theory. Um, but Russell never kind of went with that bad apple theory. He thought there were a lot of bad apples, and so he, he was whatever. And, and, and in truth, in truth the, the, the Celtics fanned him and never became like a, a, a perpetual sellout place until Cowens and Larry Bird came along. You know, um, it was always a tough sell for the Celtics. But, but that said, when they got in the playoffs, you know, it would be 13909 at the Boston Garden. That was the big thing. And, and that place would be like like heaving, you know? And, and yeah. there'd, be, there'd be no air conditioning oh, yeah. and no heat or no oh, anything, you know? I mean, the smoke. Huh? Yeah, and the smoke would be everywhere. And, and yeah, and and, uh, and you'd smell beer. And, and oh, you know, and, and people would be just hanging over. And, and there'd be a lot of noise. And, and whereas, whereas in Los Angeles, the, the forum kind of went back like this, and it was color corded and color coded, and and, and they they had already started the thing of having the famous people sit in the front, and uh, it, it was a different a different type of thing, a more laid back thing in, in Los Angeles. Yes. The Celtics paid rent. I forgot back then. Something paid rent. Yeah, no, the, the, the Bruins, that, that was the big thing. The Bruins, the Bruins uh, ruled, you know, they, they, owned, they owned the arena. And, and the Celtics, Celtics didn't practice at the Garden very often, you know, it was, it was very weird. And they, they, would pra they would practice at the Cambridge YMCA. They practiced at Tobin Gymnasium over in Roxbury, which is still there. Um, they practiced at Melrose High School in, in the middle of the playoffs. When, when it was uh, when, when they were down two, Russell took the team to Melrose High School. It was John Killalay was uh, who later became an assistant coach and was friendly with with, with Red and everything. And they, they they practiced at Melrose High School. They stopped practicing at, at the Cambridge Y because um, because their lockers were getting robbed. You know, <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, you would go you would go to Tobin Gym. You know, and. It, and they would come on after eight-year-old kids were playing, you know. And now, now they have this huge building, and everything is antiseptic, and they monitor your heart, and they, you know. Everything. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, we know now, looking back, that Jerry West was sort of going through a pretty tortured time, you know, in his in his life, having you know lost that, kind of put a lot of pressure on himself. What was that like in the moment? Was that were you aware of that? No, I mean, in, in, in his book, his Jerry West book, which is a very candid it's book, good, in the, yeah. 
and, and he got divorced after 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 the '69. And Russell got divorced after the '69 class. And, 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 and you know, so there's all this stuff going on in, in, in the middle of things. But uh, uh, you, you, you know, the, never that. But Jerry West was a very candid guy about talking about how much things meant to him and how much he, he was hurting and and. Uh, you know, he won that he won that MVP award, and they flew him to New York, and they gave him a car, and the car was 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 greedy. It was a greedy car. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, you know, he's he's always hated to come to Boston. He he was sort of like he was sort of like uh, Sir Lancelot or something out there. He was. Uh, he, he, he was just just kind of the epic Greek hero, you know, that, that, that could do it. Much, Mr. Clutch, they called him, because he scored all these great baskets. But then it got down to the end, and, and, and he wasn't Mr. Clutch. And, and it was a tortured thing for him, really. He's a very interesting, interesting player. He's had an interesting life. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.